Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here, isn't it? Yeah, of course. Thank you. I'm sure you could do better, but you're not used to it. That's fine. What I was wanting to talk about this morning is faith. And uh, well, over the next two, two Sunday mornings, I want to talk about faith. And this morning in particular, I want to talk about finding faith, or put it another way, what does faith look like? What sort of faith, what, what, what does faith look like for us in practical terms? What does that mean to live a life by faith? And, you know, we, we sort of, I suppose, I mean, for me, you have this bit of an airy-fairy idea of what it might be like. Um, but I wanted to give you some really practical illustrations this morning that show what it would look, what it looks like in the scriptures to live a life by faith. Now, we could look at Hebrews chapter 11, and we've, we've all done that before, and we've looked at that verse that says that, you know, um, we're, we're believing in the unseen things, and we've seen the life of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and, and Jephthah and Samson and, and all those wonderful people who did amazing things and, and shifted countries and, and had their, their, their kids come back to life again and and smash temples and all sorts of stuff you go well yeah it's not quite so relevant to like here and now sitting in the hall is it so i'm going to have a look at a few other more everyday examples particular ones that we find in the gospels so what does faith look like in practical terms is what we're going to ask so if i wrecked this So the first one is, is Jesus' example in um, Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verse 13 to 16 says this. The people were bringing little children to Jesus to have them touch him, but, we, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant and he said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will not enter it. It takes faith to be in the kingdom of God. And what Jesus is doing here is he's saying, we need to be like this little child to become, to be part of the kingdom of God. Now, I've chosen this picture especially because this little child seemed like it was like, oh, you know, how, you know how they get? Oh, what is ice cream, you know? And it's just like you can't control it and you're all excited and, and so emotional and you're jumping up and down. I remember the time when when my young my young niece, nephew, nephew came over. I've always been a bit gender challenged. Well, my nephew came over from Australia and he, he hopped off the plane and he came through customs and he was just bouncing around. He must have been about two or three, just bouncing around going, I went on a big aeroplane. And he was just for about an hour, he was just jumping up and down, so excited. How much excitement do we have about the kingdom of God? How much are we looking forward to it? Are we going, oh, it's coming? You know, is that, okay, and I know we're adults. You know, we're not going to do that. We're going to sit here and go, behold, it cometh. <laughs> but are we really excited? Are we really waiting for the kingdom of God like a little child does? And the other question I have about little children, or the other, the other example that little children give to me is their example of total trust. Now, have you ever seen a two-year-old, and you probably all have, when a two-year-old gets a big fright or, or something goes wrong and they suddenly feel out of control, what do they do? They lift up their hands, they turn around to mum or dad and they go, mummy, and they race for mummy, hands outstretched, and mummy picks them up and suddenly the world is all better. It's that's the sort of faith that God wants from us. And how often does our life get completely out of control 
And as it says in Timothy, brothers, lift up holy hands in prayer like a child does. Call out for God. Rely on him. Trust in him and he will pick you up and, and he will save you. We need to have faith like little children. Moved. <clears throat> the second example I have, I've got five examples. So you've got a bit of an idea of to where we are. The second example is that of the Canaanite woman in Matthew 15, verses 21 to 28. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole story. I'm not going to read the whole story. But basically what happened was that Jesus was, was in a certain place and this Canaanite woman came to him and she was calling out, Jesus, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me because my daughter is suffering terribly. And she kept chasing after him and she kept calling him and the disciples went, send her away. She's, she's being a real pain. You see, she wasn't a Jew. So theoretically, Jesus shouldn't have been interested in her. Jesus didn't answer her word. He just ignored her. The disciples wanted to send her away. And, and then when they finally came and said, said, you know, send her away, he said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And the woman came and she knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. And listen to Jesus' reply, and you probably know this. Jesus replied this, it is not right to take the children's bread and to toss it to their dogs. They're puppy dogs. They're pets. It's not right to take the, 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 the food that the children are supposed to eat and just give it to the, give it to the, to the, to the pets. How crushing that must have been. And then she made this amazing statement of faith. Yes, Lord, she said in verse 27. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And what she was saying here was that, was that she was saying, Lord, you might be sent only to the Jews, but I know there's a miracle left for me. I know you've got crumbs that, that your children are not going to eat, and I know there's something there left for me. You know, we might feel we're struggling with sin. We might feel we're struggling with sickness. We might feel we're struggling, like Nick said, uh, faith at a low point right now. And yes, coming to Jesus, there is something left over for us. We've just got to go and ask. That was what her faith was all about. There is something left over for me. And I've just got to go and ask and go and get it. The next example was the, the sinful woman. She comes from Luke chapter 7, verse 36 to 50. And it's actually quite easy to get it confused with the, uh, with the record we read today in Matthew 26. But um, it is a different story. And this woman also anointed Jesus with expensive ointment. <clears throat> so what had happened here was that um, she had, I'm just trying to find it, there it is. She, Jesus had been invited to a Pharisee's house and the Pharisees were the righteous people, the people that did what was right all the time. They were the leaders. And, and he went to the Pharisee's house and, and the Pharisee whose house it was, Simon, um, hadn't, hadn't given him a, a, you know, a greeting kiss. He hadn't anointed his head with oil, which was tradition apparently, you know, hospitality. He hadn't washed Jesus' feet, which, you know, when you've walked 100 miles in, in sandals, your feet get pretty tired and dirty. And he hadn't done that. 
And yet this woman came into the house. She was a sinful woman. She'd had a, a background of, of, well, who knows what. You, you guys might know what she did. <laughs> not going to admit to anything like that. Um, so, and she, she had this, she was this background and everyone knew her background. And she came in and she anointed Jesus' feet with this beautiful smelling ointment. And she kissed his feet. And she wiped his feet with her hair. She publicly, this was how she showed her faith. She publicly showed her love for Jesus. She publicly acknowledged that she was a sinner. And, and, and while she didn't physically ask, she, she basically did ask for forgiveness. She acknowledged that there was something special about Jesus. And Simon didn't do anything like that. Even though Simon had Jesus at his house, he distanced himself from Jesus. He said, yeah, don't come too close. I'm not going to touch you. I'm not going to kiss you. I'm not going to give you any ointment. You can sit at my table, but you can sit at the other end. And this woman came close and she touched Jesus. Simon believed in keeping the law, not in grace and forgiveness. And the sinful woman was told right at the end of that section, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Her faithful actions were acknowledging that Jesus is better than the rest. And her faithful action was to, was to show her love in a very public way. And we can do that. That's a really easy thing to do, just to show our love for Jesus in a really public way. Whether it's here this morning or when we go to work or school or whatever it is on Monday, we can show we love Jesus in a public way. We can, we can proclaim him. And her faith was a faith that saved her. And if we do the same, our faith will be a faith that saves us. The centurion <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 8, which we read a couple of weeks ago in our reading. <clears throat> now, he's an interesting guy. This is a very interesting story, and especially the way Jesus picks up this example of faith with the centurion and, um, and the kingdom of God. So what had happened here was that a centurion um, came to Jesus. Well, actually, the centurion didn't come to Jesus. It was actually the centurion's servants that came to Jesus. And they begged Jesus and they said, you know, Lord, you can come and heal the centurion's servant because uh, the centurion that we're working for, he's a really great man. He's built our synagogue and he's, he's, he's really supported the Jews all the way through. He is a worthy man. And, and the synagogue ruler had sent people because the synagogue ruler believed that he wasn't worthy of even going to see Jesus. And then, and then, and then obviously Jesus said, yes, I'll, I'll come. I'll come and heal him. So one of the messengers went running back and the centurion said, no, 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 no. He doesn't even need to come. He just needs to say the word. So the messenger came running back to Jesus again, and he goes, just say the word. And I want you to notice, you come turn this up. This is really, really exciting. Matthew chapter 8, um, verse 10. When the centurion had said, had showed the faith that he had, that Jesus could heal you know, even a Gentile from a distance, didn't even have to be there to touch him or anything like that. The centurion knew that, and Jesus said this, verse 10. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished, and he said to those following him, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. You know, that's the highest commendation of faith in the Gospels. 
the centurion. I have not found anyone with greater faith in all Israel. And what did he do? He just believed that Jesus could heal his servant and he didn't even have to come and touch him. He believed that Jesus had the authority to heal his servant. Now, I've, I, I, I don't know, just subconsciously in my mind, I've always had this, this division in my mind about faith. This, that, that there's faith that gets us into the kingdom and it's it's a faith in the forgiveness of sins, and it's a faith in in um, you know, and that Christ is coming, and it's a faith that you know He's going to set up His kingdom, and He wants me there. Fantastic. And then I've also had this other sort of faith that sits over here that says Jesus is interested in my problems now. Well, God's powerful enough to to deal with my problems now, and He answers prayer and all that sort of stuff. So you know, my day to day faith and my my kingdom picture faith. I don't know about you, but that's sort of, it's always just, just had this bit of a division for me. And you sort of like, I think you've got to have this sort of faith to be in the kingdom, but this sort of faith is pretty good and it leads up to that. So Jesus said that this centurion had this day to day faith. He had the most faith Jesus had ever seen because he believed that Jesus could heal his servant. And if we can believe that Jesus works in our lives, that prayers are answered, we have the same sort of faith. And now have a look at what follows. Jesus said this, I tell you the truth, in verse, at the end of verse 10, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you, that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places in the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside where there will be darkness and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And what he's saying here is that that centurion will be in the kingdom of God. Isn't that exciting? And it wasn't the big faith. It was the faith in everyday things. It was the faith that prayer will be answered. If we can just build that faith in our lives, we will be in the kingdom of God. Isn't that awesome? You know, it doesn't have to be big. It's in, it's in things that are happening here and now. The last example I want to share with you is this one. How not to have faith. Probably one of the most faithless, well, descriptively faithless acts was, was um, the disciples in the, in the boat in Matthew chapter 8, verse 23, same chapter. Um, the disciples got, and Jesus got into a boat and there was a great big storm came up and Jesus fell asleep. And the, and the storm was so, so intense that it looked like it was going to sink the boat. And the disciples came and woke up Jesus and said, said, don't you care that we perish? And Jesus' response to that was, where is your faith? Why are you so afraid? You see, they believed that Jesus was the Messiah. They believed that Jesus was, was, was there to save them. And if Jesus was in the boat with them, there was no way God would have let the boat drown, that God would have let them drown. I can imagine Jesus saying to them, if you think that I'm the Messiah, then there's no way that God would let us die. God wants a faith in us that casts out fear. If God is for us, then who can be against us? As Psalm 37 says, fret not, don't worry about anything. Don't worry about other people. Don't worry about, about your life, about other things that are happening around you. Because God will take care of it if you put him first. 
that's the sort of faith that he wants. So next week, we're going to talk about growing faith. So we're going to go from where we are, having found out what sort of faith God wants from us, and we're going to grow our faith. Um, and as homework, <laughs> since I, I can do this since we're doing two weeks in a row, as homework, um, I want you to think about um, <clears throat> looking for why. I want you to look, watch your life this week. And look for ways you see God working in your life. See answered prayers. You might see circumstances that God's just gone, well, I'm going to change that circumstance. You might have heard messages from people or something from the Bible that really stands out for you and has changed the way you live. Look out for the way God has worked, works in your life this week. So as we take the emblems now and remember Jesus, and as we walk out of these doors later on and go into a new week, let's come to him in faith. Let's have that anticipation, that excitement that Jesus is coming. Let's have that total trust of a childlike faith that says, oh, I need you. Let's know that no matter who we are or how we are, we can come to him and that there is a miracle left over for us. Let's allow ourselves, no matter how low we feel, to come close enough to touch him and be touched by him. Just having faith in who he is and what he can do, even from a distance. And let's let our faith in his power and love cast out our fears.